circumstances of the appointment of these seven men, and then the end of the chapter, and of course the next chapter, concentrates on one of them. So this morning I just want to title the sermon, Stephen. Stephen. I want us to look at Stephen as a godly man. An example both to men and women of what it means to live for the Lord Jesus Christ and to cope with what happens around him. And to do that because we are living in days when there's a, a change in the atmosphere concerning Christians. For many generations, no, probably for centuries, Christianity has been at the heart of our society. Now it's being sidelined and quite deliberately in places. And it seems now that Christians are fair game if you want to attack. I read a, 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 a film review yesterday by David Robinson, a film called Captain Fantastic. It's a long one, you can read it online if you want to. But what caught my attention was his headline, What Captain Fantastic Tells Us About Western Culture Today. I'll go to the last paragraph. Finally, we have the open and blunt mocking of Christianity. The standout line in the whole film is when the father tells the children, who are appalled at the fatness of ordinary Americans, that we don't mock or disrespect people. To which the youngest child replies, except Christians. This witty piece of script, says Robertson, met with a guffaw by a couple behind us in the cinema. But sadly it is true. No, right on. In touch with the zeitgeist, American or British movie maker. There's something missing there. Anyway, British or American or British movie maker. That they would never have made such a remark about Islam or any other religion or philosophy. But Christians are the scum of respectable society. So they are fair game. Stephen was fair game. And he came to the front. And I think we need to look at Stephen with modern eyes to recognise what it is to live as a, as a Christian in a culture and the world where it's no longer thought about as being right, not even sometimes good, and not certainly for our children. We need to look at this man Stephen because I believe he's a lot to teach us. I want to look at him first of all as God's man. Secondly, as Satan's target. And thirdly, as one who has an angelic, an angelic face. God's man. He's been transformed by the gospel. And everybody in his community can see it. The people around him recognise him as a godly, God-fearing, God-honouring man. And of course that's the reason he was picked. To be one of the seven set apart. To be one who administered the care for the, the widows amongst the early growing church. He clearly had a, a testimony in his life that pointed out that he who once had been a sinner was now a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And through believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, his life has been transformed. It's important to remember that that's the process, isn't it? Justification, that's being declared right with God, is dynamically linked to sanctification, which means becoming like Jesus in popular language. Stephen was obviously a man of God, and as such, he's an encouragement to us all that God has men and women down through history in whom by grace he's given them a new heart, and through that new heart they have the hope of the gospel burning bright in their lives. It's the light of the world. It's the same Saviour who's been at work in your life, who is at work in your life, and will continually to work in your life, and will help us to understand what that means by looking at people like Stephen, because the transforming power of the Gospel has never changed. I hope you're familiar with 2 Corinthians 5.17. It's one of those Bible verses I think every Christian should know and understand. It says, remember, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. 
In the original language, it means a whole new universe, a whole new personality. Sure, they carry some of the baggage of the past, but they've got a new perspective. They've got a new goal. They've got a new reason for living. Old things have passed away, says Paul to the Corinthians. Behold, all things have become new. That was true of Stephen. That's been true of godly men done through the centuries. And one in particular came to mind. And that was a man called Robert Murray McShane who lived about 150 years ago in Edinburgh and became a minister in Dundee afterwards. He had a, a, a line which often comes to my mind and one which would help us to understand God's purpose for us as Christians. McShane says in one of his writings, Lord, make me as holy as a pardoned sinner can be. Lord, make me as holy as a pardoned sinner can be. Why? In another writing he says, the Christian is a person who makes it easy for others to believe in God. We want to be holy, not, not for the buzz, not for the piety, but for the glory of God, so that they will be drawn to Christ. So we have here, we are told here, that Stephen is one of the seven men. Remember back earlier in the chapter, it, it says in um, verse 3, Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men, and here's the description, of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom whom we may appoint over this business. It's a lovely picture, you see. The apostles didn't say, well, we think these are the people who should do this. They turned to the church and they said, listen, folks, you already know who should be doing this, and we want you to identify them and set them apart, to be of good reputation. The word means to be somebody who is known for their integrity by the public. Later on, when... Um, Peter has gone to visit Cornelius the centurion. We are told that Cornelius is distinguished as a man who has a good reputation among all the nations of the Jews, even though he's a Roman centurion. He has a good reputation, and it's the same word. It means that people look at your life and they know that you can be relied upon. They know that what you say is what will happen. They know that you will not be working behind their backs. He's a man of good reputation. And interestingly enough, when it comes to the appointment of deacons and elders later on in the pastoral epistles, this concept is at the very heart of it. There to be people who are recognised as having a good reputation. But not just a good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit. Let's remember again, you see, that the Holy Spirit is the reason that a man or woman becomes a Christian. Christ, no, we need to step back, God the Father sent his Son into the world. The Son came, suffered and died for us. And then once he arose from the dead and ascended to heaven, he sent the Holy Spirit to be with us permanently. And the Holy Spirit's first work in the world is to convert men and women, convicts us of sin and of judgment and of righteousness. He shows us that we are sinners and he shows us that Jesus died for sinners and he brings us together and he makes us new creatures. It's not just intellectual, it's spiritual, it's supernatural. But the same Holy Spirit is the reason and the foundation of why a man or a woman changes to be like Jesus. We can't do it on our own. What we need is that supernatural power which will transform our lives. And it is detectable in a man or woman's life by those outside. They can't read your heart, but they can see in your life, you know, out of the mouth comes the evidence of what's in your heart, the Lord Jesus says. The way you speak, the way you live, your goals, your priorities, your ambitions, the things you like, the things you don't like, they're controlled by the fact that you are now known by God and know God, and you are then distinguished for being a man or woman of God. And then the last one is quite interesting, full of wisdom. What on earth is wisdom? I hope I've said it often enough. Wisdom means 
You know the practical side. You know what to do. Wisdom, biblically defined, is living in God's world as God would have you to live. And knowing how to apply his truth to life. I'm sure these seven men needed that continually as they sought to help these widows who were in financial or social need. When they got up close to them, their lives would be complicated with all sorts of strings, problems and attachments. And that's when you need wisdom. You need not just to be able to quote a Bible verse, but to actually be able to explain how a Bible verse or a part of the Bible actually is significant in that circumstance and is your guide and your light for the days that lie ahead. You see, the whole picture of who a believer is is captured here. It's true Stephen and the others were distinguished for it, but it is in fact the normal pattern for Christian living. It's not simply get saved from hell. The real Christian is anxious to be saved from the hell that's inside. And so McShane would say, Lord, make me as holy as a saved sinner can be. We carry the baggage of our world and the life that we lived. And it takes a lifetime to begin to get rid of many of the things that are there. But we need grace and grace comes to do that. Notice again how uh, Stephen is in fact described further in verse 5. And the saying pleased the whole multitude and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. Full of faith. The word could be turned around to mean faithful. Somebody whose life is regulated by and ordered by what God says, desires and wants. Because you're trusting him. You trusted him to save you from your sins. Now, if Stephen's our example, trust him to know what's best for the rest of your life. Who knows what troubles are coming to us this next week. But one of the things you will know is whether you're trusting God or just depending on your wits. Because if you're trusting God, you will be able to face even the, the, the hardest difficulties with the grace that God gives you. And come out the other side stronger and better for it. If you're just living in your wits, you'll end up biting your nails down to your knuckles, you'll end up running in circles, you'll end up not sleeping, you'll end up destroyed by what's going on. The man or woman of God is a person who is depending on what God has said and is then putting it into practice in their life day after day. And again, notice it's a, a good emphasis, the presence of being full of the Holy Spirit. You have to remember that our conscious Awareness of the Holy Spirit depends on a life of holiness. The Apostle later tells us twice, don't I, doesn't he, that we've not to quench the Holy Spirit. That tells us that the Holy Spirit in our life, his, his influence on us can be dampened. How is it dampened? By just going on sinning and not caring about holiness. So we can lose the, the benefits of the Holy Spirit's presence in our life. Stephen is distinguished for being a man who would day after day turn to God and cast himself upon his mercy. Verse 8 then takes us back to another aspect of Stephen. A man full of faith and power. If you're using the New King James, you'll notice there's a little mark beside the word faith. That's because there's a textual problem here. The, the more modern text behind the NIV, the ESV, etc., We'll change this word to grace, and there's good evidence that it should be grace that is in the text here. Full of grace. You see, we've been told he's full of faith. There's no point in repeating it here. What we are seeing is that this man is full of the blessing of God, because that's what grace is, is it not? God's riches at Christ's expense. God is working in his life, giving him gifts to use, for the work of the gospel because he's clearly not only one of the seven who's ministering to those in need. Stephen is also a preacher. Chapter 7 will show us that in great detail. And full of grace would indicate that he's a man 
whom God has gifted and God is using. And that grace then gives him power and he shows him signs and wonders. That's how the, the, the passage goes. Now I'm not getting into a discussion about signs and wonders for the present day, but if you put it in the context of what we're reading in Acts, signs and wonders were displayed in not only physically caring for the sick, but seeing them healed and relieved of their difficulties. Remember the man looking at, uh, at Peter and John thinking that he was going to get a good handful of money and Peter's words, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. You know how to finish it? Rise up and walk. And we're told that this was the case, was it not? So that even just coming into Peter's presence, people were being healed. Here's a man who's not an apostle, Stephen. Being empowered by God for the work that God was doing at that time in history. So Stephen's life was not only a holy, godly life, it was a gospel message. It was bringing life and light to the dead and sin. And the greatest sign and wonder for the gospel is when a man or woman hears that they're a sinner, that Christ died for sinners that he rose again the third day and that he reigns in heaven. The greatest sign and wonder for the gospel today is when men and women actually believe that. If you're a Christian, you remember it happening, don't you? You know there's been a change in your life. You're not what you were, you're not what you're going to be, but you're not who you were because God's grace has come and transformed you. So here's a picture of God's man and he should be and is an encouragement to us to live holy, godly lives. Never perfect, but being perfected. And that took me back to Robert Murray McShane. I hope you've read the story of McShane. He, he lived during his training in Edinburgh and he was actively involved in, in helping the poor and preaching the gospel. He ended up in Dundee as the minister of St. Peter's in Dundee and he worked hard and his holy life had an impact on the people there. He eventually travelled to Israel. He's the, one of the founding fathers of the Christian Witness to Israel movement. He went to Israel to see the condition of the Jews because he believed the gospel should be taken to the Jews. He was a man on fire for God, but he died when he was just 30. God took him home. But if you read the accounts of his life and they're abundantly available you will be impressed by the way of his earnestness listen to this study universal holiness of life your whole usefulness depends on this for your sermons last but an hour or two while your life preaches all week He's talking to ministers, obviously. Take heed to yourself. Your own soul is your first and greatest care. Keep a clear conscience through the blood of the Lamb. Keep up close communion with God. Study likeness to Him in all things. You see, he was a man on fire for God. I would like to think that's probably who Stephen was. And I'd like to encourage all of God's people to be that earnest about being a believer. But let me warn any unbelievers here, there is no safe alternative. None of us Christians have reached perfection yet. We're, we're still a work in process. But there is no alternative. If you continue without Christ, you will in fact condemn yourself at the end of the ages. Because your very unwillingness to come to him will be the result that you're separated from him forever. What a man is Stephen. What a life he lived what trouble he got into. My second point is he becomes Satan's target. Reading in Acts has reminded me of the reality of the spiritual battle that we are all involved in. Christianity is not simply a philosophy whereby we live a good life, where we have these pithy sayings that help us to cope with every trouble. Christianity is a relationship with God and if you're related to God, you've been delivered from Satan's kingdom into the kingdom of the Son of God's love. And that marks you and me as an enemy 
for Satan. He's defeated. Christ defeated him on Calvary, proved him by rising from the dead, but he's actively running around this world at the present time with his angels, causing chaos. And he does it, as we see here. Stephen was a marked man. The unbelievers, possibly his previous friends, saw him and they were waiting for the opportunity to pounce on him. And that's what this account tells us. Verse 9. Then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and those from Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and spirit by which he spoke. We'll stop there just for a moment, you see. The result of their hatred for him is that they ultimately kill him. You'll see it at the end of chapter 7. They want to take away his right to life. And of course that's Satan's arch work, isn't it? He introduced death into the world by drawing men and women into sin. He's the one that's responsible for the chaos and anarchy that we're watching in the Middle East. It's not just the politicians. It's where the politicians are coming from. It's who, who controls their decisions and their minds. What books they read, what books they don't read any longer. And so we see his hand at work wherever these things happen. The Jews have done it previously to the Lord Jesus. He's causing too much problems. He's become too popular. Let's kill him. And they go about that, that routine of having him betrayed and then handed over to the Romans so they can have him killed and keep their hands clean. It's happening today, isn't it? In Washington State, Friday night. A young Turkish man, I think he was just 19, went into a, a store, a big shop in a shopping mall, and shot dead four people. Or you go to Aleppo. Who was responsible for bombing that aid convoy? Look at the chaos that's now ensued. So the Syrian government now destroys almost the city of Aleppo. Who, who gets the credit for all that? Well, you can trace it back to men, and we must. But we must realise that it's the enemy of God that keeps men and women in their bitterness. And one of the strange things, isn't it, is that people object to these things by saying, why does God allow it? They want to blame God for what's happening. It's been the way down through history. Not just religious groups. Again, it's useful to realise that when people tell you they don't want religion because it causes so many wars and kills so many people, that statistically, non-religion, secularism, communism has killed more people than Christianity ever did. But of course we don't see that. We're living in a world where Satan is running rampant. And here, Stephen becomes the object of these people from the synagogue of the freedmen. The synagogue of the freedmen. That means that they were Hellenists. Remember last week I explained the difference between Hebrews and Hellenists. Hebrews were Jewish people who had always lived in the land of Israel and had grown up under the umbrella of Jewish law, teaching and instruction. Hellenists were Jews who, for one reason or another, had left the country. Some were taken as soldiers, some were taken as slaves, others moved willingly. And then what they did was they came back to Israel, back to, pa to Jerusalem, for the feasts of Passover and Pentecost, etc. So at this time, there's a great bunch of them in the city, and they're being converted from both groups. Let me just go back a step. The Hellenists are distinguished by this, that they speak Greek rather than Hebrew. And they've absorbed some Greek culture and thinking. 
Now Stephen is a Hellenist. Remember it was the Hellenist widows who weren't being attended to. So the seven men who were chosen were all Hellenists. We know that because the name Stephen has a Greek background. And there's every chance that he was once a member of the synagogue of the freedmen. The phrase freedmen refers to the fact that when some of these Jews had been taken away, they were slaves. But for one reason or another, they won uh, their freedom from slavery and then came back to Jerusalem and they set up a synagogue. Jewish religion centered around the temple. That was the only place you could sacrifice and worship. But aside from the temple, they had synagogues. They had been developed during the Babylonian captivity when they couldn't go to the temple. The synagogue was very like our modern gospel church. What they did was they brought out the word of God and they preached it. And the people worshipped God. And it would be like our modern gospel church. It was cultural. So you've got churches here in England, you've got churches in France, you've got churches... Well, I don't need to go through the list. And everyone you go to will have a, a characteristic from that group. So the synagogue of the freedmen were Hellenistic Jews who had been brought back. And we are told that they came from Cyrene, Alexandria, Cilicia and Asia. Cyrene and Alexandria are in North Africa. Cilicia is part of what we call Turkey. And Asia is part of what we call Turkey in modern times. So they're from all over the world, if you want, of that day. And they're not happy at all with Stephen. And they're not happy and they enter into a public debate. That's the phrase used in here. And disputing with Stephen, it's a formal word from the first century, which means they would sit on a platform and they would discuss things across the platform. But the trouble was that though there was more from the synagogue of the freedmen, they never won their argument. And how do you respond when you can't win the argument? Well, you either go away in a huff or you beat up the other person and dispose of them. And that's the plan for Stephen. He's too clever for them. He's too clever for them. They're not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. From chapter 7, we get a picture of how he spoke. What he was doing was going through the Old Testament and he was showing them that the Old Testament was not about setting up Judaism. The Old Testament was about preparing the world for Jesus' coming. And just like I was trying with the children this morning, the story of Joseph, great story as it is, is not only the story of Joseph. It's the story of Jesus. How do I know Luke chapter 24, the risen Christ took the disciples back through the Old Testament and showed them how it spoke about him. And so you would have that passed on to Stephen, and as I will show you in chapter 7, God willing, in chapter 7 he actually demonstrates this at work. And if you're a dying little Jew, and you really believe that the Israel alone are God's people, you really believe that the Jewish set of religion with the Sanhedrin and Pharisees and Sadducees and all the festivals and what it's about? Well, when you hear Stephen, you think there's trouble coming. The Saviour had warned the disciples this would be the case. Luke 21, 12. Before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. You will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake, but, you will, but it will turn out for you as an occasion for a testimony. Therefore settle it in your hearts, not to meditate beforehand on what you will answer, for I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversities will not be able to contradict or resist. When you've got promises like that, dear friend, you can actually face the lions. The monsters of life are only monsters for life. You can actually step forward in faith. So these men want to find a way to get rid, to get rid of Stephen. So what they do is they turn like the Sanhedrin to dirty tactics, don't they? Then they secretly induced men to say, verse 11, We have heard him speaking blasphemous words against Moses and God. You have to notice the order of the words there. 
The first priority is Moses. That would indicate that it's the Jewish religion. It's what we are doing as a result of what was given to Moses on Mount Sinai. Or, well, of course, God's included. But it's religion they're concerned about. And, of course, religion like this becomes a monstrosity. We see it in modern Islam, don't we? Where you've got this small minority of Muslim folk. Most of them are peace-loving peace loving, and uh, just want to get on with life. But you've got this small minority who, who, who are going back to exactly what Muhammad said and did. He's very different to the Lord Jesus. You see, the Lord Jesus is the Prince of Peace. Muhammad was a, a desert warrior. You need to read the Quran sometime. He led armies out to kill and to pillage. But here these Jews are much more like Muhammad than Jesus. They're ready to fight and to destroy. And those tactics have been used regularly down through the world. You touch our religion, look out because we're getting our boxing gloves on. When Paul is in Ephesus, Acts chapter 19 verse 28, and he's been preaching the gospel, the people get upset. It says, now when they heard this, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. So the whole city was filled with confusion and rushed into the theatre with one accord, having seized Gaius and Ar Aristarchus, Macedonians, Paul's travelling companions. You need to read the whole story there. We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God was the first charge. <clears throat> read on, this man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place. You see, it's our building. The Lord Jesus did talk about the temple being destroyed. But if you go back and check the context, it's the temple of his body. But they've taken it literally and they're using it now as a, a, a reason for chaos. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses Notice again, which Moses delivered to us. And so Stephen has lost the right to live. The Jewish religion is the reason for this fracas. God is secondary. Satan is at work. Satan is passionately at work. And he loves to stir up religious bigotry and trouble. The Lord's people have always been a loving people. We are taught to turn the other cheek. We are taught not to use the sword, but to use the word. And we are only allowed to take up weapons if somebody is actually physically threatening us or our families. But not in satanic world. He writes his own rules. But be encouraged, he can't win. He didn't win. The Saviour's already demonstrated it. When Satan poured out as much anger and wrath as he could on him on Calvary, Christ died and rose the third day. Not only for our justification, but to declare that Satan was vanquished and bound, cast down to the earth. He knows his time is limited. But as Peter says, he goes about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He wants to mess up the Christian world. He wants to mess up Christians' lives. And that's what we're seeing in the modern world. You see, we've had a great wave, haven't we, of Dawkins books. And all the unbelievers like think they've found the key to why there is no God, and it's a piece of nonsense. The fact is that Dawkins only argues with those he thinks he can win before. When William Lane Craig came to this country, just, I think it's three years ago now, it was arranged for him to dispute with Dawkins, and Dawkins refused to attend. The debate went ahead with an empty chair. Because Dawkins is just a whole bag of hot air if you study him. What I found interesting just this last week was this little report. Atheist Richard Dawkins leads Judith Barbarsky to Jesus. She writes, 
Truthfully, I found the book God Delusion a waste of my time, as it afforded me no cogent arguments concerning the existence or non-existence of God. In fact, not only was Dawkins disrespectful of opinions other than his own, I found his statements about Jesus to be so ill-informed that I resolved to actually learn something about Jesus Christ. And if you read the rest of her account, she's now a believing Christian. But if you go to the media, the lion's still roaring, isn't he? They'll give him press and they'll keep you silent. My time is gone, but I just want to go to the last section. It's very brief. And consider Stephen's angelic face. I couldn't find another phrase to turn it around, so just bear with me for a minute. What's the significance of this angelic faith? It's the kind of look that a godly man or woman has when he or she knows he's not alone, although he's in the firing line. It's the kind of look that comes, that peace, calm and composure, when the godly man or woman finds that the whole world's against them, but they realise, as Brother Andrew once said, that one man with God is a majority. It's the kind of look which says, do your worst. At the very best, all you can do is send me to heaven. He had the face of an angel. There's other accounts of Moses being on the mountain, remember? He came down with his face shining and had to cover it. Remember the Lord Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration? His, his face shone. He's in the presence of God. He's reflecting the presence of God. And here, he, here is Stephen in this group of men. And it says in the text, they're looking steadfastly at them. I can't help but thinking what long faces they must have had. Gloomy, serious. Doesn't this man realize who we are and what we can do to him? what they saw was the face of an angel because he's God's messenger and down through history Christians have often been in that circumstance as I said it will take some time to go through chapter 7 but again Stephen finishes his life looking into heaven and seeing the Lord Jesus and through that he's ready he felt the peace that passes all understanding where do you go from there Christian history is just so full of it. examples of godly men and women who at this kind of a circumstance have experienced the, the presence and the power of God in their life. And it's an encouragement to us that the promises of God about persecution only kick in when we're under persecution. It's not something you can put in the bank and keep. It's something that happens at the time. I was drawn to think about Jan Hus. I hope you know that story too. You see, Christian history is something you have to read. He lived in Czechoslovakia in the 15th century. You've heard the statement, haven't you, that we'll cook his goose, or he's cooked his goose. The reference is to Jan Hus, because Hus in Czechoslovakian, which is where he came from, is the word for goose. What happened, this man came to the truth of the gospel in the 1400s and he became a preacher in Prague. I was there some years ago and they're still at the church building. Fascinating place. You can go in and stand in the pulpit and what I found interesting was it's not like this that the congregation sat in a circle right round them, 360 degrees. Some, it was obviously a well attended church but the legal authorities didn't like it and they took him or they summoned him to answer for it and then they used that to actually kill him. He called for him to recant, but he stood firm. And on the day of his martyrdom, he said, God is my witness that the evidence against me is false. In the truth of the gospel I have written, taught and preached, today I will gladly die. And then it says, as the crackling flames consumed him, he joyfully sang a hymn. The presence of God in his life. I'm not sure I'd like to experience it as he did. But we have the promise. Read the books. God promises that grace to us all. But when you need it will be when your workmate, your neighbour, comes on you and mocks you for Christ. Don't be intimidated. That's just Satan doing what he does. Look to God. Realise that a godly life, 
man or a woman, walking with God is the most powerful thing in the world. And like Job of old testified, though he slay me, yet will I praise him. Yet will I praise him. McShane says, if I could hear Christ praying for me in the next room, I would not fear a million enemies. Yet difference makes no difference. He is praying for me. He is upholding us. How can anybody continue as an unbeliever? When you have the evidence of men like Stephen and others down through history, you should realise that Christ is the only reason for living and everything else is futile. And I do think we're in days where things are changing. My time's entirely gone. I've even gone over my time. We're living in days which are entirely changing. I finish with a quotation again from David Robertson. I uh, would want you to think about reading what he writes. He, read, he, he wrote on what he said on Premier Radio. Have you heard of Daniel Smith? He's a member of the Australian Olympic 4 times 200 metres freestyle relay, relay team and his story is an inspiration. Smith was a homeless drug addict who became a Christian and ended up at the Olympics. As have a lot of other Christians such as Sean Miller, the 400 metre gold winner from Barbados who said, I just give God all the thanks and praise or Christine, and I can't pronounce that name, British 400 metre runner who said, even if it doesn't go too well, you still give thanks regardless. How about David Goodyear and Steele Johnson, American diving champions? We both know our identity is in Christ. And it seems, says Robinson, as though I'm reading or hearing about yet another victorious Christian athlete every day except on the BBC. When Usain Bolt fell on his knees to thank God after he won, the BBC presenter talked about it being a moment to himself, but it was clearly the opposite. It was an act of public worship, which would have been condemned as crass and distasteful if it had been an ordinary mortal. But because it is a hero, then it has to be explained away as something else. We're living in changing days, friend. And we need to recognise we need to be like Stephen, men and women of God, if we are going to cope with living in this world till Christ takes us home. Amen.